The MCU's Black Panther films, like the comics before them, developed the people, history, and culture of the Kingdom of Wakanda by referencing and incorporating many aspects of real-world African peoples. But here are what I think are some missed opportunities in doing so. As a Jamaican of African descent, 84% according to Living DNA, reading up on African history and culture is a bit of a hobby of mine. There is a lot there that I don't know, and it was fun to see Black Panther try to depict that in a fantasy setting. One could argue that melding all these African cultural tidbits into one is perpetuating the untrue idea that the genetically, linguistically, and culturally diverse continent of Africa is a monolith, and I have done so in the past. But for the sake of this video, let's just have some fun and look at some world-building missed opportunities in the MCU's Black Panther. In essence, this is a list, in no particular order, of what I would have done if I had been in charge of the Black Panther films. All sources are in the description of this video. Number one, a gorilla god. In Black Panther, we learn that the Jabari, led by M'Baku, worship a god named Hanuman. Glory to Hanuman. Unfortunately, Hanuman is a Hindu monkey god, and Hinduism originated in the Indian subcontinent, not the African continent. Although I understand why the writers chose to remove the comic name Man Ape from M'Baku's character, I wish they would have found an African monkey god for the Jabari to worship, or at least one associated with monkeys or apes. For example, there is Muluku, supreme god and creator deity of the Makua and Banai peoples of southern Africa. When he created the first humans, they ignored his instructions of how to use tools, preferring to live in trees. However, monkeys followed his instructions, so he took the tails of the monkeys and placed them on the humans. Monkeys became humans, humans became monkeys. Then there's Ngidi Strong, a gorilla god of the Yaoinde people of Cameroon. He, along with his brothers, created humans in their image. Wise, curious, foolish, and strong. There's apparently a cult by the name of Ngi in Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which I missed. I should rewatch it and look out for it. In any case, I'd have preferred Ingi or Maluku or any other simian god be referenced in the first Black Panther film instead of Hanuman. This is a missed opportunity, in my opinion. Number two, other panther gods. Speaking of gods, T'Challa mentions Bast and Sekhmet in his first MCU appearance. In my culture, death is not the end. It's more of a Stepping off point, you reach out with both hands and bust and segment. They lead you into the green veld where you can run forever. Both of these are Egyptian gods. What about other African gods? For example, there is Apedemak, a lion-headed warrior god of the Meroetic peoples of the kingdom of Kush. And Agasu, the Dahomey royal king who is a son of a leopard and who rose to the honored position of a loa. Even if they wanted to keep Bast as the primary deity of Wakanda, it would have been nice to see other feline deities referenced in the films. Maybe each could have been the patron of one of the tribes. That would have been interesting. Number three, writing. You may or may not know that the producers of Black Panther chose the real life is Mosa language as the language of Wakanda. It is an official language of South Africa and Zimbabwe. Unlike many languages of colonized peoples, it was given the writing system of their colonizers, which means that Isit Mosa is written in the Latin alphabet. As a student of linguistics though, I was annoyed at the fact that the producers of Black Panther chose a one-to-one -one replacement cipher to create the Wakandan writing system. Basically, not all writing systems are alphabets, and even those that are alphabets aren't all like the Latin alphabet used for English, Spanish, and other European languages. Looking at Isit Mosa, it looks like its syllables are largely composed of a consonant followed by a vowel. Number 4. 
or just a single vowel. This means that they could have created a syllabary, a writing system in which every character represents a syllable. That would have been a lot more work, of course, since syllabaries need to have more characters, but I think that would have been a more interesting choice. Number four, drums. I know we come to the one that inspired this video. Drums are an important part of cultures all over the world, and that includes Africa. However, there is a specific type of drum that is quite fitting for Black Panther's Wakanda. This is a war drum for the Ashanti. That is a war drum of the Ashanti people. This leopard skin drum works not by striking it, but by rubbing the stick over its surface to produce the sound of a leopard's roar. Considering the main god of Black Panther lore is Bast, a panther goddess, and leopards are a type of panther, I wish they had used this in the films. Number five, names. Ngabani. Prince Njobu, son of Azuri. When I watched the first Black Panther film for the first time, I was disappointed that the Wakanda naming system was a simple name, son of father's name. I have tried looking for indigenous African naming systems that followed this pattern, but came up empty-handed. I do understand why it's there from a storytelling perspective though. Njadaka, just by saying his name, is able to say that he is son of Njobu, and thus of royal blood. Plus, it could be interpreted as an homage to the Jewish roots of the creators of Black Panther, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. That's how the Hebrew naming system works after all. If they wanted to give Wakandans an African naming system though, they could have used the Yoruba naming system. In the traditional Yoruba naming system, no one is given someone else's name, whether by virtue of being their child or spouse. In this naming system, a person has an Oruko, Oriki, and Orile. An Oruko is divided into two, a name which you carry with you from heaven, that is a name that you have by virtue of how you are born. The second part of the Oruko is the name given to you by your family. And then there is the Oriki, the name given to you to represent a trait or a quality you have. And then there is the Orile, your family name. It is not changed when you marry and stays with you your whole life. Having an Orile would have been a good way to identify Njadaka as part of the royal family, I think. Other African traditions include naming based on the order of birth, as done by the Kalenjin of East Africa. They can also name people based on the day they are born. For example, my pen name, Kwame, is given to people born on Saturday, which is why I chose it. I was born on a Saturday. If you know any other African naming systems or conventions, let me know in the comments. I'd love to learn about them. Number six, that could have been us. This last point is a significant deviation from the rest. I know I said at the start of the video that this video is going to be all fun, but I lied. This section is not going to be fun. The Kingdom of Wakanda has a natural resource that helped her to become the powerful nation she is in the MCU and other Marvel media. But what if Wakanda had been colonized controlled by powers that did not care about her well-being, the well-being of her people, exploiting them, forcing them into inhumane working conditions. For the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, this is not just a thought experiment. It's reality. As Anna Henson wrote in 2022, DRC was once a country with sophisticated aristocracy an impressive civil surface. However, the arrival of Portuguese traders in the late 1400s brought with it the destruction of political force and order. Rebels were armed, kings slaughtered, and succession encouraged. By the 1600s, the once mighty kingdom had disintegrated into a leaderless anarchy of multi-states, locked in endemic civil war. Over the next hundred years, the country continued to suffer. 
King Leopold of Belgium claimed the DRC as his private property, denied the Congolese education, murdered leaders, and forced the people to harvest rubber. And having been weakened over the centuries by brutal colonialism, the nation suffers under neocolonialism as our people are forced to mine cobalt under dangerous and slave-like conditions just to make ends meet. This has allowed corrupt leaders to take power and a quiet genocide to take place, one that I find not nearly enough people are talking about. I'm going to provide links to videos in the description and the cards at the top right of this video if you want to learn more. And I would encourage you to click on them because they will explain the issue much better than I can. However, I ask you to help if you can. In the description, you will find links to charities that will help the people of the DRC, Focus Congo and Mutual Aim. Talk about what's happening in the DRC and for that matter, Haiti and Sudan. Let people know that people are displaced and starving. They need help. The issues in the DRC have been taking place for a long time. I would have liked the Black Panther films to call attention to it by name. It could have even been just a few lines. Maybe T'Challa or Nakia could say, we could have easily been like the Congolese if Bast had not revealed to us the heart-shaped herb and colonizers found our vibranium before we did, we could be suffering right now, just as they are. It seems the suffering of those of us in Africa and the African diaspora tends to fly under the radar. Please, don't let it. Thanks for watching. I've been Ken Kwame, and I'll see you next time.